making positive impact for the kingdom of God. And in his ministry, he brought about four things that are important for us to make impact. He said for us to be persons of impact, we must know our position. Secondly, he said for us to be people of impact in our communities, we must be good neighbors. And by being good neighbors, we must stop unnecessary noise and disturbances in our communities and live godly lives. Thirdly, he reminded us, for us to be persons of impact, we must pray for our communities. And in praying for our communities, we take spiritual authority to demolish territorial spirits. He referred us to Ecclesiastes chapter 8 verse 4. The New King James Version of that Bible says, Where the word of the king is, there is power. And we were reminded, beloved, last week that we are kings and we are priests on the basis of our faith. Kings are people who command matters to be if they were not. Priests are persons who offer sacrifices that are acceptable before the Lord. That is your position as a believer in Jesus Christ. Fourthly, he reminded us to be good models and good examples. And he told us one good example is better than a thousand summons. We concluded last Sunday's sermon by asking ourselves the big cue, the big question. Are people following Christ as a result of your life or are they running away from him? Are people following Jesus Christ as a result of your life or are they running away from him? That being the recap, I draw your attention to the book of Ezekiel 47. Ezekiel 47 verse 1 to 11. I remind us our theme positioned for impact. I will read this from the New Living Translation of the Bible. Ezekiel 47 verse 1 to 11. In my vision, the man brought me back to the entrance of the temple. There I saw a stream flowing east from the beneath the door of the temple and passing to the right of the altar on its south side. Verse 2. The man brought me outside the wall through the north gateway and led me around to the eastern entrance. There I could see the water flowing out through the south side of the east gateway. Measuring as he went, he took me along the stream for 1,750 feet, a different version says a thousand cubits, and then led me across. The water was up to my ankles. He measured off another 1,750 feet and led me across again. This time, the water was up to my knees. After another 1,750 feet, it was up to my waist. Verse 5, Ezekiel 47. Then he measured another 1,750 feet, and the river was too deep to walk across. It was deep enough to swim in, but too deep to walk through. He asked me, have you been watching, son of man? Then he led me back along the riverbank. When I returned, I was surprised by the sight of many trees growing on both sides of the river. Then he said to me, this river flows east through the desert into the valley of the Dead Sea. 
The waters of this stream will make the salty waters of the Dead Sea fresh and pure. There will be swarms of living things wherever the water of these rivers flow. Fish will abound in the Dead Sea, for its waters will become fresh. Life will flourish wherever this water flows. Fishermen will stand along the shores of the Dead Sea, all the way from En Gedi to En Egleim, the shores will be covered with nets drying in the sun. Fish of every kind will fill the Dead Sea, just as they fill the Mediterranean. But the marshes and swamps will not be purified. They will still be salty. Beloved, I ask that we pray for this word. If the Holy Spirit does not quicken this word, it will be just any other reading, like we do read a novel or a newspaper. The Bible tells us that the Spirit of the Lord, he searches for the word of the Lord to perform it. We trust as we commit this word to the ability and the power of the Holy Spirit, he will search it, and direct it to every person who is in this congregation. And we also pray that the same Holy Spirit, whom the Bible says, the entrance of the word of the Lord brings healing and understanding to the simple, that the same Holy Spirit will cause this word not just to be alive, but to enter in each one of us, everyone who is in the church today, and bring understanding. That is what makes a difference between reading the Bible and reading any other publication. And so as we pray, submit yourself to the counsel, to the power, to the authority and the ability of the Spirit. Why? Because He is the Spirit of truth. And the Bible tells us He leads us into all truth. We trust that He will lead us into the truth of the word today. Heavenly Father, this word has its origin in you. And we pray, loving Father, as we sit to listen, may two faculties in our lives be impacted by the truth resident in this word. May our minds be impacted. Why? Because it is in the mind that there is an ongoing transformation. The Bible tells us that one of the things we require to do is to be renewed in the transformation of our minds so that we may know what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God concerning us in Christ Jesus. Therefore, our Lord, we pray that the Holy Spirit, he will direct this word to our minds and therefore cause transformation. The second place we surrender to you is our heart. Our heart is the depository of your word. The Bible tells us out of our hearts come forth issues of life. We therefore pray today that the Spirit of the Lord will also give and direct impact to our hearts so that the depository of your word in our hearts may progressively bring forth issues of life that are determined, dictated, and in agreement with the word of God. With that understanding, therefore, Heavenly Father, we take spiritual authority, we take spiritual power, we take spiritual dominion over any contrary spirit that is not from the throne of God. We render captive any contrary thought that would want to interfere with the flow and the process of your Holy Spirit. And we do pray, Heavenly Father, that you will have preeminence in this ministry today. May our lives be informed, may our lives be transformed, and may our lives, as a result, 
become impactful in the places where you have positioned us. For this is our prayer to you for ourselves in Jesus' name. Beloved, we speak to us today on the topic, depth determines impact. Therefore, be deep. Depth determines impact. Therefore, be deep. I will do an introduction by making reference to a quote which we have referred to in the past. But because it is relevant with what we want to speak today, permit me to quote this again. It is a quotation from Richard J. Foster. Richard J. Foster is the author of the book Celebration of Discipline, The Path of Spiritual Growth. And he has said in this book one of the quotations, and I quote him, Superficiality is the curse of our age. The doctrine of instant satisfaction is a primary spiritual problem. The desperate need today is not a greater number of intelligent people or gifted people, but for deep people. End of quotation. Our need desperate today is not a greater people who have great intelligence. Neither is our desperate need that of gifted people. Our greatest need as a church, our greatest need as a county, our greatest need as a country are men and women who are deep in God. The vision recorded in the text we have read is one among a series of many that were revealed by God through Ezekiel the press, the priest. He tells us he was by the Kebab River. This vision is preceded by three other prophecies. And the three other prophecies include a prophecy of the immediate captivity of Israel. Secondly, a prophecy of the judgment upon other nations. And thirdly, the prophecy of Israel in the last days and the millennial temple and the eternal reign of the Messiah. It is in this final segment of these prophecies that we have extracted the text, Ezekiel 47. And the text we have extracted is a vision which refers to the gospel under the figure of a river. This vision can also be referred to as a vision of measurements. And therefore, you could refer to this text as a gospel under the figure of a river, but you could also choose to call it the vision of measurements. Ezekiel begins by telling us where the revelation began for him. And I said to us, beloved, seated here today, every revelation of every believer who is seated in this church today began somewhere. For me, my revelation of Jesus Christ began by the roadside, 27th of September 1989. 7.30 p.m. by the roadside in Isli, 7th Street, between 7th Street and Wood Street. I do not know where your vision for the Lord, if you are a believer, began. But every vision of every believer, by God and with God, begins somewhere. For the prophet Ezekiel, he tells us in verse 2, there was a divine hand, he refers to him as a man, he brought me outside the wall through the north gateway and led me around to the eastern entrance. There, I could see the water flowing out through the south side of the east gate. 
As Ezekiel communicates, we are also told of four quarters. We are told of the east quarter. We are told of the west, the south, and the northern quarter. These quarters indicate the direction of the compass. And these quarters also indicate our earthly possessions and how we stand in relation to the sun. My dear brothers and sisters, when you want to know which direction the sun is at, you must be conversant with the four directions of the compass, the north, the south, the east, and the west. The sun rises in the east and goes down to the west. I am reminded of the song we used to sing when we were growing up as young Christians at Valley Road. We actually would do it in the worship and would say from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Malachi chapter 4 verse 2 in the New Living Translation of the Bible tells us, but for you who fear my name, the son of righteousness will rise with healing in his wings and you will go free Leaping with joy like, like calves let out to the pasture. We therefore see two positions as far as the sun is concerned. At the natural setting of nature, there is the sun as we see it, and there is the sun as we experience it, including the emitting of light and warmth as we are experiencing today. But there is also the spiritual aspect where Jesus Christ is made reference to as the son of righteousness. The scripture we have read, Malachi chapter 4 verse 2. This scripture makes reference to the Lord Jesus Christ. And in several other passages of scripture, the coming of the Messiah is pictured as a sunrise. Isaiah chapter 60 verse 1. The Bible says, Arise, shine. For your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. There are also other references of the same in 2 Samuel chapter 23, verse 4, Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 4. And by way of spiritual application, how do we make application spiritually in regard to those four dimensions, the north, the south, the east, and the west. Looking at Christianity, for those who are nearest the Son of Heaven, they become very near as a result of their pure love for God. And these persons who have a pure love for God are referred to as persons who are in their spiritual east. And to such the son of righteousness arises with healing in his wings. To those who are in the spiritual west, they are referred to as those who have little or no love for God at all. To those who are in the spiritual south, this is a position where the sun is at midday. And at midday, the sun gives out its greatest light. These persons in their spiritual south represent the state of such a person, whether they be man or woman, who are fully enlightened in spiritual intelligence. To those who are in the spiritual north, the north is normally the place of cold and fog, and it represents the condition of those who are absolutely spiritually ignorant. My brothers and sisters, take note of the position where the prophet is. The prophet is in the way of the gate northward. In other words, he is beginning his journey from the position of spiritual ignorance and absolute cold. Beloved, that's where each one of us began our spiritual journey. We did not begin our spiritual journey in the knowledge of God. 
we began our spiritual journey in absolute ignorance. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26 to 29. Remember, brothers and sisters, that few of you were wise in the world's eyes or powerful or wealthy when God called you. Verse 27. Instead, God chose things or the world considers foolish in order to shame those who think they are wise. And he chose things that are powerless to shame those who are powerful. God chose things despised by the world. Things counted as nothing at all and he used them to bring to nothing what the world considers important. As as a result, no one can ever boast in the presence of God. My brothers and sisters, the next thing Ezekiel mentions of is a gate. Gates represent introductory truths. The outer gate spoken of in Ezekiel 47, by the river which looks eastward, means the most general knowledge which leads us toward the Lord. Brothers and sisters seated in the hearing of this gospel message, the preaching of the gospel to anyone begins that someone from nowhere with the intention of leading that person to the place of the saving grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the rising sun of our soul. This is the infancy knowledge that brings us to the knowing of Jesus Christ. I say to us as a church today, if that is where you are, the place of spiritual infancy, the only thing you can talk of is, I am born again, and I am going to heaven perpendicularly. I tell it to you, my brother, my sister, if you are still in that position of spiritual infancy, you will not make any impact at all. My brothers and sisters, the elementary stage, the knowledge of Jesus Christ becomes the beginning of our journey for conquest. Every baby who was delivered when and where they were delivered, it becomes for them the beginning of a journey so that they can be men and women of impact in their society. The man who was leading us today, our brother Osiru, was not born as a teacher. He must have been delivered a baby like every other baby. If that is all he remained, he will not be standing telling us what the Lord is doing in the school. I ask you today, beloved of the Lord, are you still in the place of the elementary knowledge of Jesus Christ? If that is where you are, your impact will be very limited if indeed there will be any. Kindly note, brothers and sisters, the leading for Ezekiel began with the receipt of the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And the Bible, the King James Version says, and the leading by the divine hand that was leading him was leading him about and leading the way without. That sounds like absolutely confused English. The leader was leading the prophet about and he was leading him the way without. We'll explain it. In the process of being led about the way without, that kind of a leading contradicts with our spiritual expectation of the Lord when we get saved. When we got saved, we got saved with great expectation. We, get, we got saved believing that we will be blessed and blessed in the now. After all, we have Christ. 
We got saved believing that favor will be ours in the immediate now. We got saved believing that victory finally is ours. We got saved believing that that husband who had been elusive finally will come on board. We got saved believing that that wife will come. We got saved believing the job, the promotion, the house, E-T-C-E-F-G-H-I-J-K-L. I said to us, beloved, that is not what God does when he saves us. When God saves us, the first thing he does is to lead us about the way without. Like the songwriter who gave the song that was sung, he begins by breaking us gracefully. God does not bless us the day we get saved. He begins to prepare us for his blessings. And in so doing it, one of the things he does is to lead us about the way without. In other words, there seems to be a lot happening in you, but nothing you can take home. You sound like you are idle. Your wife will look at you and ask you, why don't you behave like any other man? Use your head. When the Lord is leading you about and taking you without, there is no time to use your head because it is time for God to work on you. If you have been told in the period of being led about and being led without that you do not think Hold on to God. He will vindicate you. One time when he is done with you, he will help you to start thinking. Right now you cannot think because you are being led about and led without. You are also confused. You have no idea where you are going. The only thing you know is that there is a God who is holding me with his righteous right hand. And he has promised never to leave me nor forsake me. In the process of being led about, the way without, it contradicts with what we believed ought to happen when we get saved. I got saved by the roadside, 26th of September, 7.30 p.m. I had a turban on top of my head. The reason I got saved, Elder Karanja, is because the lady who prayed for me told me in English, I needed everything to be sour because I was in plenty problems. And so I got saved by the roadside with great expectation that everything that had gone out of order will fall into place. Two weeks later, I almost backslid because matters became very, very difficult. Was the problem God? No. The problem was my introduction to salvation. It doesn't happen that way. God takes you about the way without so that he may take you to the gate where he begins to grow you as a Christian. Beloved, when God leads us about the way without, things begin to change. Our pursuits change. Our previous partnerships dislocate and new ones are located. Our localities change. Our friends change. Our priorities change. Old mannerisms go. Our associations change. About and without seems like God is taking too long. Beloved, if you have waited on the Lord on a particular matter, you have taken too long and you have actually voiced it. It is because you are still holding on to what God wants to let go so that he begins something new. When God begins to take us about the way without, he is leading us that way so that we can drop the old in order for, to create room for the new. He allows us to go around and without so that he may bring us to a new position written in your scripture. He wants to bring us to the right side, a place of honor. 
and a place of defense. After all, the Bible says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation, all things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. When the Lord is taking us in a manner to suggest that all is lost, it is then that we come into contact with new people. It is then that he brings us into new situations. He brings us into new thinking. Our positions in life change and people begin to say we are different. Of course we are different because there is a God who is instituting change. In the process of being taken about and without, we suffer afflictions in losses of one kind or another. We separate with people we highly valued. We separate with things that were precious to us. We discard places that were important. They begin to diminish in value. Things we considered useful cease to be useful. All this in the process of being led about the way without. All this happens in order for God to bring us to the outer gate by the way that looks eastward, for there run waters of truth flowing from the love of God. The Apostle Paul captured that truth very well. In the book of Philippians chapter 3, verse 3b, all the way to verse 10. Reading from the New Living Translation of Scripture. The Apostle Paul says, We rely on what Christ Jesus has done for us. We put no confidence on human effort. Though I could have confidence in my own effort, even one could. Indeed, if others have reason for confidence in their own efforts, I have even more. Verse 5. I was circumcised when I was eight days old. I am a poor, pure-blooded citizen of Israel and a member of the tribe of Benjamin. A real Hebrew, if there ever was one. I was a member of the Pharisees who demand the strictest obedience to the Jewish law. I was so zealous that I harshly persecuted the church. And as for righteousness, I obeyed the law without fault. I once thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything else is worthless, when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For this sake, I have discarded everything else, counted it all as garbage so that I could gain Christ and become one with him. I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law. Rather, I become righteous through faith in Christ, for God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith. My brothers and sisters wanting to be persons of impact, it is only when we are brought away from and away to that we can make a mark. I will repeat that. It is only when we have been brought away from and away to that we can begin to mark our spiritual progress. The Apostle Paul said it very well. He said, this one thing I do. I forget the things that are in the past, away from and press on towards the mark of my high calling in Christ Jesus. When we are brought away from, 
and we are brought away to. Then and only then are we able to mark our spiritual progress eastward where all the matter and when, where all that matters is the son of righteousness. And therefore Ezekiel, positioned from the north where there was nothing, then this divine hand begins to measure a thousand cubits, 1,750 feet. The Bible says the first measurement, 1,700 feet, the waters were at the ankle. Who is the Christian whose waters are at the ankle level? This is a person who has not only learned and reflected upon the divine commandment. This is a person who also loves the commandment and has been able to reduce them to practice. A person whose water is at the ankle level is one who has been able to advance to the place where he is able to make application of the word. It is one thing to have your eyes on God. It is a totally different thing to have feet that can walk you to where God is. A thousand cubits ankle high. He could fully understand the letter of the word and all that related to moral outward life. I ask you, brethren, men and women, congregated in this church today. Are you at the thousand cubits where you are able to learn and you do learn and you are able to reflect upon the divine commandments and you are able to reduce them to make them practical. You cannot be a man or a woman of impact unless you have been able to get to the first 1,000 cubits in terms of understanding, learning, and reflecting on the word of God. Before I go to the second and third measurements, permit us to remind us Christians that our Christian life has three grand stages. Stage one is the infancy stage where the Christian is governed by obedience. This first stage is the infancy stage of our faith. At this stage, a Christian who is simply governed by obedience will inquire very little further about any religious duty. They don't do anything beyond confessing, I am born again, I love Jesus Christ with all my heart, end of the story. This kind of a Christian is the one who will question everything when it is suggested. They will actually ask, has the Lord said it must be done? They are born again. They are actually going to heaven by grace. But they do not inquire any matter religious further than simply simple obedience. This is a Christian who asks, must I go for the early devotions? This is a Christian who will ask, must I go for the Wednesday prayer meeting? This is a Christian who will ask, why should I go to church on Sunday? Yet there is sitam online. Why don't I watch it in the house on television? This is a Christian who will ask, must I join the women ministry? And especially now that they have begun a dance team. This is the man who will ask, must I be in the man's ministry? And especially now that they have begun a men's chorale. This is the Christian who asks, must I be in the safari group? This is the Christian who asks, must I pray and fast? This is a Christian who asks, must I pay my tithe? And by the way, must it be gross or not? This is a Christian who will ask, must I date a believer pastor? 
I know he is not born again, hallelujah. But he is not too bad. He will get born again as we continue. Reverend Dennis White would call it high class nonsense. Beloved of the Lord, if you are on stage one, take it from me. Very little impact or no impact at all. Stage two. When we are in stage two, we begin to see the beauty of the truth of God. And we consider that truth as a glorious thing in itself. We also begin to consider that truth as worthy of all acceptance. At stage two, my brothers and sisters, God's truth becomes a pearl of great price. Remember, the Bible tells us of that person who found treasure in a particular portion of land. And the Bible tells us what he did. He sold everything else in order to go and buy that portion of land that had treasure. In stage two, faith and the things of faith become objects of supreme importance. And in stage two, we follow the truth for truth's sake. In stage two, we do not become careless. Neither do we become carefree. We simply prioritize Christ. After all, he has said it in scripture, seek after my kingdom and my righteousness. And all these other things shall be added unto you. I ask you, Christian friend, are you already stepping into stage two? The next stage is stage three. When we enter upon it, stage three, we enter upon it by being introduced into a state of supreme love. The love of the Lord. We also enter it with this understanding that everything that comes from him is our delight, whether it is good or bad. In stage three, we are in agreement with God. All things work out together for good to those who love the Lord and they are called according to his purposes. In stage three, we don't love the Lord because we understand. We love him because we have an amazing trust in him that he is able to make a way for us where there seems to be no way. Job of old had gotten to that stage. God decides to take him through a test and the test involved the demise of everything he had. The wealth, the women, daughters, the sons. He went through it. And the wife was observing in pantomime. Then the wife could not handle it anymore. Went to Job and told him, Brother Job, this is my quotation before I bring back the scripture. I have just realized that you don't think like every other sensible man. I have news for you, my dear husband. When matters get to this stage, now that you are thinking, let me, you are not thinking, let me think for you. When matters get to this stage, my dear husband, Mr. Job, this is where you cast God and die. Brother Job responded to his dear wife and said, you have spoken like a foolish person. I ask you today, dear ones, you want to be a man or a woman of impact? Mark chapter 10 verse 32, I believe, it tells us, unless you are willing to forsake mother, father, son, daughter, brother, sister, and the list continues, you are not worthy of me.
Beloved, when God was taking us about and the way without, he wanted some matters discarded so that he can begin to take you to the position of impact. We don't go to the position of impact with excess baggage. We go to the position of impact, full of God. I ask you, sir, where are you at with the Lord? In your desire to be a man or a woman of impact. We then come back to the measurements again. In stage three, we love the Lord's law, we love his truth, and we love him himself. At this stage, my brothers and sisters, listen to your pastor. This is where we part company. I will repeat that, beloved. At this stage, this is where we part company. Do we have a biblical example? Yes. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. Three Hebrew boys who are slaves. They were in captivity, but they had God with them. The community around them looks at them and decides the only way we can get these persons is the place of their God. So a device mechanism is put in place. A golden God is positioned and a decree is communicated. And they are told for the next number of days, the only God you can worship is the God who has been established by the king at a particular place. My brothers and sisters, go back to that scripture. They did not go to the mountain next to Gilgal to consult the Lord whether that is something they must do. They did not ask for time to go to Cataloni. They did not request for time to pray and fast to respond. They were immediate in their response. They said, this is not a matter worth considering. We shall not bow. We know our God is able to deliver us from that fiery furnace. We have no doubt. But on the basis of his sovereign will, not in ability, if he chooses not to get us out of that fiery furnace, even then we shall not bow down. End of the story. I ask you, my brother and my sister, if you want to be a man or a woman of impact, there are matters of necessity that you must leave behind. The second 1,000 cubits, the waters were up to the knees. The first 1,000 cubits, the waters were here. Obeying the commands, excited by the divine instructions, making application of them in life. In this second 1,000 cubits, while it is good to obey the command of the Lord, like it happened in the first 1,000 cubits, it is a totally different thing to open your mind to understanding. At this stage, the second 1,000 cubits, we become merchants seeking for godly pearls. At this stage, values are put in place and they become non-negotiable. At this stage, each text of scripture, when opened, gives new delight because at this stage it is no longer knowing the word of God, it is understanding his word. At this stage, my brothers and sisters, it is a mind opened by the presence of an interior love of truth. And it is that truth that makes glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. 
I ask you, sir, and I ask you, madam, in your desire to be a person of impact, are you walking in understanding the word of God? Again, he measured another 1,000 cubits. And the waters were up to the loins. The loins are the portion of the body where the previously separated limbs, the lower ankle and the knees are joined with the upper part of the body. It is at the loins where the ankle that was the first to step in and the knee where it is at. It is at the loins that this part of the body is jointed together with the upper part of the body. My dear brothers and sisters, what does this mean to us today? The Bible tells us that the just shall walk by faith. Walking happens with the legs. But it is at the loins where that walking by faith unites by, with love because the ankles do not know how to love. They have no feeling. The knees have no feelings. The feelings are expressed from the loins. When we get to the loins level, our walk of faith unites with love. You cannot be a person of impact if the only thing you are is walking by faith, but your emotions are not attendant to that walk of faith. Beloved, it is when the waters get to the level of the loins that love unites with faith. When our minds are so advanced in the regenerated life, every truth we come to is also seen to be full of love. At this stage, the water was up to the loins. It is at this stage that fear and doubt are left far behind. For scripture says, perfect love at this stage casts away fear. Faith is submerged with love into the waters of the word of God. For then the word of God is seen as the infinite wisdom. At this stage, righteousness and peace go hand in hand. And there is an entire union of love and faith within. Beloved, I ask us today, is your walk of faith anchor deep? Is it at the knees? Or has the walk of faith united with your emotions, the love of God included. It is possible to walk by faith and not love the Lord totally. You will disconnect at the first instant if yours is just a walk of faith that is devoid of any emotional involvement. And the last 1,000 cubits the Bible tells us it was a river he could not cross. The waters had risen and the waters were deep enough to swim. Then in verse 6, he asks him an interesting question. Son of man, do you see this? What is he asking him? A different version renders, son of man, Pay attention to what you have seen. The King James Version renders a different meaning. Son of man, hast thou considered or taken notice of this? A different version also renders a different meaning. And it says, son of man, note all this carefully. 
Church of Jesus Christ in Sitam Nakuru. Do you see all this? Are you paying attention to what you have seen? Have you considered or do you take notice of this? Church Sitam Nakuru, will you note all this carefully? Ezekiel goes back to the riverbank. And as he goes there, he is told the waters heal. They are headed to the Dead Sea. They will neutralize the salt nature of the seawaters. They will rectify the taste and smell of the seawaters. Because of these waters, fish will begin to flourish. Because of these waters, by the banks of the river, trees will begin to grow on both sides of the river bank. Because of you getting to that place where you can only float with the power and in the power of the Holy Spirit, businesses will flourish again. Families will thrive again. Families will heal again. Relationship will blossom. Workplaces will be impacted. The county will be impacted. The country will be impacted. Ministry will change. Things will take a different direction. When we go to the place where we can no longer walk on the water, we have to float and swim. I ask you, church in Sitam Nakuru, where are you at today? In your desire to be a man or a woman of impact. It is unfortunate that at the conclusion of that scripture, the Bible tells us there will be some marshy areas that will still remain marshy and they will still remain salty. It is possible to preach as such. It is possible to be on a whole yearly theme, possession for impact, and you remain the same, same way you were before you began. It is possible for waters that change an entire sea to pass by here. Waters that cause life to begin again. Waters that cause trees to grow. It is possible, Brother Osiru, for waters to pass by here and next there is a marsh that is still marshy and it is still salty. It is possible, sir. Marshy areas are not in the desert. Marshy areas are next to the rivers. And I ask you, my brother, I ask you, my sister, are you a marshy area where there is a possibility of fresh waters flowing by, causing impact everywhere else except with you and except in you? It is possible to be a marshy land, salty, next to a river that is causing impact. I ask us today, where are you, beloved? What do you give priority to? Because that is what determines impact. When we get to that place where we can no longer walk because it is too deep, but too deep becomes an opportunity for us to swim. Ezekiel 39 verse 29 then says, At that stage, I will no longer hide my face from them, for I will pour out my spirit on the house of Israel, declares the sovereign Lord. How do you get deep? Joel chapter 2 verse 12 to 13 and verse 17 the New Living Translation of Scripture. It says, that is why the Lord says, turn to me now. While there is time, give me your hearts. Come with fasting, weeping, and mourning. 
Don't tear your clothing in grief, but tear your hearts instead. Return to the Lord your God, for he is merciful and compassionate, slow to get angry, and filled with unfailing love. He is eager to relent and not to punish. Let the priests, verse 17, who minister in the Lord's presence, stand and weep between the entry room to the temple and the altar. Let the priests pray and say, Spare your people, Lord. Don't let your special possession become an object of mockery. Don't let them become a joke for unbelieving foreigners who say, Has the God of Israel left them? My brothers and sisters, This is our responsibility, yours and mine. You have a role to play for you to become a man and or a woman of import. There is our place as priests to intercede. There is your responsibility as a man and or the woman who wants to be a person of impact. At that point, the Lord promises restoration. If you go to Joel chapter 3, verse 18 to 27, it is a restoration. And in verse 29 to verse 29, he also promises his spirit. For he says, then, after doing all these things, which things, between verse 18 to verse 27 of Joel 27, I will then pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. And your young men will see visions. Verse 29, in those days, I will pour out my spirit even on my servants, men and women alike. Let me therefore correct a particular position. The particular position I want to correct, beloved, is your place of impact is not necessarily dependent on your pastor. Your place of impact is determined by how you are walking with your God. I ask you, sir, where are you at? Are you at a thousand cubits? Are you at two thousand? Are you at three? Or are you swimming? in this great liver. In conclusion, what are the benefits of depth? When you are deep, you have spiritual authority and power. Acts chapter 1 verse 8, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and into the ends of the earth. When you are deep, you are also a person of spiritual discernment. Galatians chapter 5 verse 16. Walk in the spirit, so I say. Walk in the spirit so that you do not gratify the desires of the flesh. I'll tell you something, beloved. When you are pretending to be spiritual but you are carnal, the witness of the Holy Spirit tells us. Oh, I saw this vision. Oh, you know I was shown this. My brothers and sisters, while I respect the place of the Spirit of God, I also respect the fact that there is a Spirit of God in me who discerns whether what you are telling me is true. When you are deep in the Spirit... You can go telling me all the kinds of visions God has shown you. I will tell you, my brother, I will listen to the witness of the Holy Spirit. He bears witness with the Spirit of God, and I will know when you are cheating to impress. When you are deep, you walk in spiritual discernment. 
It will not matter what everybody else has seen. What you have seen, if God intends it for me, he will reveal it to me. He knows my name. He knows my address. He knows where I am. Don't go impressing everybody when all you are doing is impressing and there is nothing. My brothers and sisters, let's walk in spiritual discernment by being deep. When you are deep, you have spiritual stability. You don't waver, you don't tremble, you don't move out of track. This one has said this about you. Keep on moving, spiritual stability. This one has thought this about you. Keep on moving, spiritual stability, because you're deep. You don't get moved by every wind of doctrine. Today you are here, tomorrow you are there. Deep people are spiritually stable. God, if you can bless me in Nairobi, you have the ability of blessing me in Nakuru. I will wait in Nakuru. After all, this world and the fullness therein and all those who dwell in it belong to you. I don't have to change position. I will remain so that I may see the salvation of the Lord. When you are deep, you are spiritual stable. Things might not be right physically, but I have an inner confidence. The Apostle Paul said it, I know in whom I have believed in, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. I'll tell you something because my wife is in the house today. We waited for our own apartment for eight years. Eight years. We had paid the deposit. We started the mortgage. Something went wrong. I talked to them about the apartment until every time I look at them, Elder Kitinga, they were so fed up of this story that I actually stopped talking about it. Two weeks before we took possession, I made a mistake. I told our son, Daniel, we are finally going to take possession of our apartment. He asked me, Chau kweli, daddy. <laughs> Chau kweli. They had heard that story until it was oozing out from their mouth. It was so annoying. Then one day, in the fullness of God's timing, the 11th of May this year, eight years later, we go and take possession. Today, she doesn't know what to do with the bedroom. It is too big. Eight years later. Was it difficult, Brother Osiru? Yes, from my own family, my wife included. my friend. Daddy, I shut my mouth. I only started sending photographs from within the house to confirm to them I'm actually inside. I ask you, sir, I ask you, madam, how deep are you? Because depth will determine your spiritual stability. And lastly, Depth will determine your spiritual victory. Depth will determine your spiritual victory. The Apostle Paul said it, I know in whom I have believed. And because I know whom I have believed, I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. I ask you today, 
How deep are you? Because that depth determines spiritual victory. You want to be a man and a woman of victory, of impact? Be deep. Don't get moved by everything that is said. Stand. Stand. And when you have done all, stand. You want to be men and women of victory? Be deep. And be deep in the Lord. Let's bow down for prayer. Everlasting Father, we entrusted ourselves to your Holy Spirit. The reason we did this is because beyond this time of summon, we shall depend on him to continue renewing this truth. Our Lord, we have been on the shallow end for too long. No wonder there is too much dirt that we keep on raising up. After all, our feet are on the seabed. Our feet are not floating on the water. And any time we are on the shallow end, with feet on the ground, the effect is too much mud, too much soil, too much muck. No wonder we backbite one another and feel nothing. No wonder we accuse one another and feel nothing. No wonder we ridicule one another and feel nothing. The list of no wonder, no wonder is so long that it could get to the town of Nakuru. Yet, Heavenly Father, we have a spiritual camouflage. We cannot be suspected because we have a spiritual camouflage. But we are not deep as a church. As a people, as women, as men, as youth. And today, our Lord and our God, permit us to ask you to begin a journey of spiritual conquest. so that we can be men and women of impact. Holy God, we know what needs to be done. If it is accepting Christ, we don't have to wait for the day. We simply accept and begin the journey. If it is allowing you to position us, we simply surrender, forgetting the ridicule of the people who thought in our surrender we were foolish. Of course we were, because we did not understand what you are doing. We simply surrender to you, knowing that one day you will prove us to be wise and prove them to be foolish. Our Lord and our God today, Having spoken to us in the manner in which you have spoken to us, do not leave us where we have always been. Begin with us a journey that must be covered. This is not a maybe. This is not a probability. We want to be positioned for impact. We cannot be positioned unless you bring us 
to the place where you prepare us to be men and women of impact. And therefore, our Lord and our God, we surrender ourselves to you, whatever that means. We surrender ourselves to you, whatever this will do. And like the song was sung, break us gracefully, our God, we pray, because our hands are open in absolute surrender. May this, for many of us, if not most of us, become our turn around point so that we stop blowing up too much dust and mud unnecessarily. Bring us to the place where the river is too deep for us to walk. We can only swim. Allow us, our God, this privilege. In your mercy, in your grace, and in your kindness. For we do pray this to you for ourselves today. By faith in Jesus' name.